And in order to survive, you need to move forward and reach a final destination. And with your eyes closed, imagine there's no landmarks. You have no map, no compass, and no guide to help you on your journey. So if you've imagined that, if you've got your place, your, yourself in that place, I want you to open your eyes now. Now the good news about this that is that if you've already accepted Christ as your Savior, you have a map. You have a compass. And you have a guide, the Holy Spirit. But is there something that you're holding on to that's stopping you from receiving or using that map or that compass or that guide? Now, if you were taking a hike or you were walking on a long journey, you would want to be as light as possible. You wouldn't want to be carrying a, a pack that weighs as much as you do. You want to be able to be taking that journey with as little as possible. Because you don't know how long that journey is going to be. You don't know what obstacles you could run into. You don't even know your final destination. What I'm talking about is the baggage that we all hang on to and we allow to define who we are. The baggage that we are going to be bound to on this journey you just imagined. Some of us may, some may look at us and if we were honest and they said, how much do you weigh? And you were honest with yourself, you would be shocked and how much you weigh. And I'm not talking about your actual weight. I'm talking about the baggage that we carry around each and every day. Consider it your spiritual weight. And unfortunately, until we let that go, we do carry it every day. So what is your baggage? We're going to look at some baggage today. There's a lot of baggage that we can have. Consider baggage as something that separates you from God and doesn't allow God to give you the things that you need. The first thing I want to talk about is past relationships. We're going to look at Matthew 5, 23, and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come to the altar. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as your brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. What this verse is saying is that we need to live our life in harmony with each other, with those and with the relationships that we have. And if you can't do that, you could be separated from God. Is there somebody in your past, either recent or distant, that you have something that you have to deal with, I urge you to go to them right away. Make it right. Don't let this be something that weighs you down. That next piece of baggage that I want to talk about is our past in general. Does your past define you? Do you relive past decisions? Do you allow your past to determine if you're worthy or not? Psalms 103, 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. 
as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our, transge our transgressions from us. The only reason that your past can define you is if you allow it. If I... <laughs> If I allowed my past to dictate who I am or how I acted, I can guarantee I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't be part of the family that I am part of now. I can probably say that I would either be dead or in jail. So turn away from it. Allow God to take it from you and trust in him. And I promise you, your past won't have any power over you. Now I'm not saying that you could forget it or that it's going to be easy. I'm saying that it doesn't have to define who you are or how you act. And if you're one of those people that your past keeps coming up to you and trying to define who you are, if you struggle with it, there's a great saying that I heard once and I use it a lot. If Satan keeps reminding you of your past, just remind him of his future. So the next piece of baggage I want to talk about is possessions. Are you one of those that use the phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins? Do you think that if you can get that next best thing, it'll make you happier? Does your security lie in the things that you have? Now, I'm not saying that having things is wrong. I'm not saying that having nice things is wrong. And I'm not even saying that working hard to get something is wrong. The problem with possessions is where the importance lies. Are they more important? Do you put them before your family? Do you put them before your friends? More importantly, do you put your possessions before God? And you know, this happens a lot more than you would think. Just like any baggage that we're going to be talking about today, possessions are no different. You, and only you, can be honest with yourself, evaluate yourself, and see where you stand before God in this. And in all of these areas we're talking about. Luke twelve fifteen says, watch out. Now, this is Jesus speaking. So when Jesus says, watch out, watch out. It says, watch out, be on, on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus says that the good life has nothing to do with being wealthy. So be on guard with greed that's desiring the things that you don't have this is exactly the opposite of what society is trying to say to us advertisers spend millions and millions of dollars to entice us to make us think that if we have that next best thing if we have that next best product that we're going to be happier we'll be more fulfilled more comfortable in this life. How do you respond to that constant enticement? We need to learn to tune out these enticements and concentrate instead on a truly good life. A life which is really living a relationship with God 
and doing his work. The next piece of luggage I want to talk about is pride. We've all heard the phrase, pride goes before a fall. What do you think this statement means? I think this statement is literal. I think that if you look at any situation where we fall into sin, you're honest with yourself and look at that, that prior to that fall, pride had a very large part in it. Somewhere we thought that we were smarter or better or bigger or more important than a situation or a person. As a result, if we are honest with ourselves, in some way during that, we crash and burn. And unfortunately, because of pride, there's the possibility that someone else could be hurt. If you don't believe me, read John 11, 45 through 53. Even when confronted with the power of Jesus, some refused to believe. Even the eyewitnesses not only rejected Jesus, but they plotted his murder. They were so hardened by pride that they preferred to reject Christ than to admit they were wrong. Be aware of pride. If we allow it to grow in our lives, it can and will lead us to enormous sin. And yes, separation from God. And we are all susceptible to pride. Don't think you're not. Even the disciples fell into pride. Look at Mark 9.39, or Mark 9.34. It shows that even the disciples argued about who was going to be the best, the highest held amongst them. Another piece of baggage, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is an unwillingness to pardon or acquit someone of their sins or wrongdoing. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That should slap you right in the face. If you hold something against somebody and you can't forgive them, guess what? Your father cannot forgive you. And if that doesn't knock you to your knees, you should really evaluate yourself. This is just as important when it comes to forgiving yourself. Now, this part of forgiveness can probably be some of the hardest things to learn on forgiving yourself. And we could do a whole service on just self-forgiveness. So I, I urge anybody that is in this room that is dealing with self-forgiveness and, and struggling with it, instead of me going off on a small section, which it won't do it justice, I urge you, reach out to one of our elders, to Wes, to somebody that you respect deeply, and that, let them help you get through this area of unforgiveness of yourself. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. This really means if we do not forgive, Satan wins. Where do you find yourself in this area? I also can speak from experience. This was one of the toughest things in my life that I had to go through. And for what? 
the opportunity to not allow God to forgive me or anything that I have done. Which leads us right into the next piece of baggage. Judgment of yourself or of others. This is to pass sentence upon, condemn, to act or decide as a judge, to form a negative opinion towards something or someone. Romans 2, 1, and 3, 1 through 3. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. How, we know, how do we know that ju God's judgment against those who do, do such things is based on truth? So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same thing, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Slap in the face. Whenever you find yourself feeling justifiably angry at somebody's sin, we should be very careful. Often the sins that we notice clearly in others are the same ones that we're allowing to take root in ourselves. We may find that we are committing the same sin, but we kind of justify it because it's more sociably acceptable when we do it. For example, a person who gossips may be very critical of others. Others that gossip about him or her. Matthew 7, 1 through 5, these verses start out with, Do not judge. Jesus' statement, do not judge, is against the kind of hypocritical, judgmental attitude that tears others down in order to build ourselves up. It's not a blanket statement against the, all critical thinking, but a call to discerning rather, be, discerning rather than negative. In verse 7 of those verses, Jesus said, Expose the false teacher. And Paul taught that we should exercise church discipline, but we have to trust God to make the final judgment. Our next bag, piece of baggage we're going to look at is worry or fear. Now, this piece of baggage is usually the largest because there is parts of every piece of baggage in worry. Do you worry about relationships? Do you worry about money? Do you worry about not forgiving or being forgiven? Do you worry about guilt, bitterness? And yes, I even know people that worry about worrying. Philippians 6, 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. So do not worry, saying, What shall I eat? What shall I drink, or what shall I wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your, he your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be given to you as well. Now here's the verse that most of us uh, know, verse 34. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Worrying about things, they don't make it easier. As a matter of fact, I submit to you that dealing with something while worrying about it just makes it harder. With that said, I think a little bit of fear is a good thing. 
as long as that fear turns you to God. That fear, that little bit of fear, makes you understand you have to go to God. Ask Him to help you with it. Matter of fact, ask Him to completely remove it from your life. I don't know how many people I talk to, and after talking to them, I, they understand that the only thing that worry does is it creates bad health. And yes, just like all of this other stuff, it separates us from God. Earlier I had said, you know, if you've accepted Christ, you have that road map. You have the compass. You have the guide. That doesn't mean you keep it and you get to use it no matter what you do. We fall short of His grace. We fall short of His love. We can separate us, ourselves, from Him. And when we do that, we lose the opportunity for His help. We do that. He doesn't separate from us. Our actions separate us from Him. Now, this, this message is called Baggage Claim. So, we're going to do something that we've never done here before. I'm going to come around with this mic... And we are not leaving here today until everybody in this room claims their baggage and calls upon Jesus to release it. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But I did that. How many of you had this just gut-wrenching feeling just now? How many of you went, Oh my gosh, I can't do that. I did that to show you that that's how easy it is for us to have that feeling and say no to God. To hide it. To think we can do it on our own. It is difficult when we realize that we just have something that's separating us from God. That thing we just felt in our gut is usually what keeps us from turning to God. And you have to know it's there. You have to know how to deal with it. So we aren't going to turn this on. It doesn't even have a battery in it. You have to go to God honestly. It doesn't matter what kind of mask you put on. You have to go to Him with a sincere heart and allow Him to work in your life. These are just a few things that we call baggage. There are many things that are baggage that we couldn't go through them all. But remember what I said. Baggage is something that separates us from God and what he has for us. What is your baggage? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it pornography? Anything that separates you from Christ is a piece of baggage. You know, the interesting thing about baggage is that as stressful and overwhelming and destructive as it is, there's some benefits that people can find in it. For instance, you may know that baggage that, you're, that you have, you could hide behind it. It keeps anyone from knowing the real you. It keeps you from, it protects you from the criticism or the rejection or even the time when it's hard to have those relationships and take the risk that it takes to have a good, solid relationship. You can hide behind it. But of course, once you go down that path with all that baggage in front of us, it's really difficult to see where you're going. It's really difficult to take a step carrying all that baggage. And it's pretty lonely. You're isolated. 
You're sitting in this little corner all by yourself, wrapped all this baggage around you. You can't even get to a point where you can let somebody into your life in a meaningful way. You even can get to a point hiding behind this baggage where you don't think God sees it. And you can be in control. Guess what? Psalms 139, 2 through 4 says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and laying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. No matter how good you think you are of hiding behind this baggage, God sees it. You aren't hiding it from God. Even if you think it's in your mind, God knows it. Now, by now, some of you are saying, I've already heard this. What you're saying is you have to give it to God and not take it back. Really, I wanted, I, I wanted to bring this out so you can see the importance of recognizing baggage. And some of you, you hear the word baggage, you think, yeah, I've heard it before. It's, that's, that's really sweet. So let's put some different words to it. How about bondage? Use the word bondage with whatever you're dealing with. You are bound to that and you, your hands are, you're, you can't receive. How can you receive if your hands are here? If you are bound by this thing, you can't receive. The good thing about it is if you like the word bondage and, under, and that's where you want to go with it, there's a great study that you can do. It's called Bondage Breakers. So there's some of you out there that are like, okay, that's a good word. Still doesn't make me stand up and take notice to what's separating me from God. So let's come up with another word. Let's see, what's a good word that might get people's attention? How about adultery? Does that get your attention? I challenge you that adultery is the act of stealing the affection of another who right, so rightfully deserves it. So, when you choose these things that we are calling baggage, it takes the attention away. It takes what God so rightly, rightly deserves. It takes it away from him. So if what you're doing really defines adultery, what do you think? Does it get your attention a little bit? Now, we started with a word picture. And it's really cool because I love the fact that Jesus spoke and taught with stories and somewhat word pictures because we were, were able to absorb it more. And we talked about, we start, when we started, we were in that place all alone. Now, close your eyes and put yourself back in that place. Now, some of you might not be able to do this because you don't hike, you're not in the woods. If that's the case, then picture yourself on a boat in the middle of a lake or on a mountaintop skiing or whatever it is you do. And when you're doing that, usually you know, me loving the woods, I know that when I'm a little off base, and I'm not quite sure where I am, and I get a little anxious, I don't recognize things around me. But when you're doing the things that you love to do, and you're free of the baggage, so to speak, beauty is really there. How many times have you walked through the woods and with nothing else on your mind but how beautiful it is around you? And you absorb that. You suck that in. You love that. Because there's nothing stopping you from seeing that beauty. But put yourself in that same place, carrying your baggage, you don't get to absorb that beauty. 
You don't get to absorb that experience. For those of you right now that are saying, you know, I want him to help me. Matter of fact, I want him to take this from me. I want him to find me worthy. So you know what? I'm going to wait upon him. I'm going to wait on him to do that for me. People, he's already done it. By the blood of the cross, he's already done it. He got on that cross and allowed his body to be broken for you. He laid on that cross and poured out his blood for you, for your forgiveness, for your worthiness. He's done it already. All you have to do is accept it. And it's there, and if you aren't accepting it, it's because you're putting something there so he can't give it to you. It's on you. It's not on him. He's done it already. Ask yourself, why do you keep taking these things back? Why can't I just give it to God and leave it to Him? And live life in a great way. I submit to you that it's about comfort. The longer we carry something and the longer we hang on to something, we get comfortable with it. You allow it to start defining you. And whether you admit it, you're going to live with it. Because you don't have the guts. to That little thing that happened earlier, that turned in your stomach, you don't have the guts to fight it. You don't have to fight hard. It's just, please God, I'm here. Humble yourself. You need to stop putting those things in front of you that stops you from re receiving from God. I promise you that God is much more comfortable than anything that you could carry around or hide behind or think that you're better than. Give them a chance. The first thing I asked you when I stood up here is the last thing I'm going to ask you before we worship. What's stopping you from receiving what God has for you?